Um, I have a note to, on how to say ciao to you. Annyeong aseyo. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I use these words, it means hi in Korean because she knows Korean. She started. Some stuff that I know. I'm a random person, so I have to apologize in advance. <laughs> but another fun fact about you is that you was a digital nomad for almost three years before setting in London. Yeah. It's the first time that you are in Italy? No, 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 no. Okay. No. And wh where have you been? Um, uh, Capri, um, South, Milano, somebody, a club, yeah, amazing, Capri, <laughs> Naples, yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Random person, again. <laughs> And another thing that I know about you is that you are certified makeup artist. Random, yeah. Yeah, okay, <laughs> but we, we are not to, to, to have a stage uh, outside about this, I suppose. And today, you're going to talk about managing data. Is that? Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, managing data and resources in uh, uh, the progressive web app like a pro. So the stage is yours, folks. Laura Moninigo. Yeah, hi. I have to tell you that, you know, one of the things that I don't like in conference are food. Because I was like, okay, time for lunch. And then I was hoping, you know, like a sandwich. I live in the UK, I have to say first. This is important information. And then there was actually real food. I forget that I'm in Italy. So thanks for that. Okay. So today we're going to talk about managing data and resources in your PWA like a pro. But before we start, I have to um, clarify a few things. Maybe you're thinking, oh, again, about PWAs, uh, not interested. Even if you don't work with PWAs, um, if you basically work with the web and you have to manage assets and resources, this is also useful for you. The second clarification that I have to share is that I'm so excited to be here <laughs> because this is like my first in-person talk after, I don't know, three years. So it feels like people are, you know, like, yeah, they're breathing. And so today I will ask you, like, be present as much as possible. If you don't like something about what I say or you have questions or you're excited, clap, laugh, say boo, whatever. To me, so excited to have real people. And in fact, let's just start with some kind of engagement. Um, let's take a selfie, everybody. When I say one, two, three, everybody make some noise, okay? Yeah, okay. One, two, three. Okay, that's how I can start now. Woo, this feels good. Okay, so uh, how many of you are familiar with PWAs? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of you. Um, if you never worked with a PWA before, a PWA is just a web app. Something that I have to clarify, this is not like something that Google created and it's a new type of technology at all. It's just a web app with advanced features, okay? Of course, it's the, the difference between a normal web app and a PWA is that it's tried to make it look and feel like a native app, similar. So, and some of the features that I have to share with you is, first of all, it should be responsive This is almost mandatory. Even if you don't, if you're not working with a PWA, your app should be responsive. Uh, of course, it should be fast. And this is what we're going to focus today, offline. It should have um, some features that are available offline. Okay? Of course, there are more features, but this is some of them. And again, 
is just a web with pro features. So what do you need to build a PWA? Again, something that sometimes people or developers can be a little bit confused about is, OK, I will already create my web app. And now what I do is like I just create a manifest file to install. What does it mean to build a PWA? Remember, you need to have three things. First thing is uh, have HTTPS. This is like the very first step, basic of the basics, OK? Because if you, first of all, if you don't add HTTPS, your user um, the chance to operate and try your app. Um, besides that, it's the very first step, because apply HTTPS, you're not going to be able to apply, for example, service worker. The second thing that you need to have is a manifest file. A manifest file is the one that is going to make your app installable and uh, have some kind of features that is going to make it look like a, like a native app. And the last one, and it's kind of the more complicated, are service workers. Service workers are the ones that are going to make your app installable. So, but let's start before going deep into service workers or whatever kind of thing. Um, let's start talking about assets, okay, and how we can manage assets on the web. But what is, what does it mean to manage assets on the web? And what's the difference between a platform specific app? Is there any Android developers here? <laughs> okay, so just to share, this is not something that is PWA against Android apps or PWAs against native apps. Both can live together and also PWAs can be a good alternative, but they are different, especially because when you install a native app, you install a whole package, okay, with all the resources. So these resources are always available offline. But with a web app, you don't, you don't have that. You can just have some of the resources offline. In this case, well, I can tick some boxes. But there is the second one that you need a network to download assets when required. And this is true, at least the first time. But also, thanks to PWAs, you can also have the chance to have reliability and actually give the user a good experience even if they are offline. That's the idea. So the problem is that sometimes, even like ages ago, <laughs> um, you have to rely as a developer on HTTP cache. And again, if there was not any network, we always saw you know, the dinosaur or whatever, we were not able to manage how the resources or how we can, what we can do with our web app. Fortunately, the web has evolved a lot, a lot. And right now, the good news is that we have client-side storage solutions, OK? So again, the idea of today and of about this talk is that you know which kind of solutions you can apply when it's about resources. And also, try to check some of these uh, strategies, OK? So let's check about which are the one of these good news and which are the solutions that um, we can implement nowadays. I will start with web storage. Web storage is asynchronous. Synchronous, sorry. It's a synchronous API, but it's very limited. It's more when you have like a small file size um, or, let's say, the resources that uh, doesn't have, you know, um, like not something like a file, uh, like a below or anything like that. Um, and then we have cache storage, which is a collection of HTTP requests and uh, response. I don't use this that much, to be honest. But let me share with you the one that is kind of new and is very useful, index db. 
everybody is familiar with index B? Okay, the ones that are not familiar yet, I'm very happy that you are gonna learn something new. <laughs> index DB is very kind of recent, and as a difference between index DB and web storage, index DB is asynchronous. And is, of course, is from the client side. And it can store um, an object uh, like a no relational database. And again, it's asynchronous. This is a very important information. Today, we're going to talk about index DB and how you can apply it. But at least right now, you also have different strategies and solutions. And then, besides that, we have catching strategies, OK? So let me just mention a few of them. And the ones that I use most, or the ones that are better between different situations. Pre-catching is very straightforward. Basically, what you do is, uh, at very, very first, uh, which resources that uh, you really want to save and be available offline, OK? The second one is catch as needed, because sometimes you have resources that you don't always like wanted to catch to save space in your catch, right? That is catch as needed. And the third one is APIs and web services. Sometimes we need information or data that is in third. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to ask you to use this microphone okay. because. We are having some issue with the, with this and sorry for the interruption. You can I don't know like make a joke in the meantime or something. Okay, back one two three. I'm not gonna sing. No worries. Um, so going back, when you have APIs and web services, sometimes we need to call third parties APIs and we need to manage them. So we can also do things in our HTTP response to actually catch these resources. And even better, we can combine these resources with IndexedDB. So let's talk about IndexedDB. What is it and how you can use it? Again, this is thank thankfully because our um, yeah, current development environment and modern browsers allow to have modern features around the web. So what is it? Again, it's just a low-level API. It's on the client side. It stores uh, like a no-relational database. And um, it's asynchronous. This is very important. But what, what do you do with uh, IndexedDB? Basically, the cycle or what IndexedDB can do is open, open a database first, it create an object, right? Start a transaction, it can be read, write, delete, any database transaction, and it completes the operation and then do something with the results. The do something with the results in the client side can, can be interact with the DOM like showing the results in the screen. But how does it look like the structure, the data? This is um, an example. Uh, again, as you can see, I'm very happy to be here and eat proper food. So uh, I was thinking a good example about using um, IndexedDB is to create a to-do list, right? A to-do list is very simple. You can save your data, and it's per user. You don't have to have this data along all, all, the, uh, all the app because it's personal. And um, yeah, it's very straightforward. So the information here is just a JSON with an attribute, right? And it's value. You can also use um, key generator when it's index DB, and it's very straightforward. But this, because this is not something that 
oh wow, this is new, I need to use it, or oh, please don't do this, like, no, the other day I went to a conference and uh, Laura told me that I need to use IndexedDB. No, no, no. You always need to check which are the limitations of this technology. Again, this is a client-side thing, so one of the things that you need to be aware is that if the user uses private mode, it's not gonna work. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is the internationalized strings. <laughs> I always confuse about the word. Um, because when, when it's time to look for strings or order by, it's not gonna work with some types of characters that are not, uh, for example, in our language. Um, again, other thing that is really important is usually we have some backend data. And sometimes we think, oh, this is going to solve uh, a lot of things that I need to do between the back end and the client side. It doesn't have a synchronous way to interact with the back end and, and the client side. So you need to write code for that, OK? And it doesn't have full text searching. What does it mean? You know when you do SQL that you use like, and you find like with something, it doesn't have that. And that is very important. But again, for another kind of things that, let's go back to the example of the to-do list, that is very simple. I don't need like any um, alternative in terms of um, installing a, a server or even using a, back, a, a, a serverless um, architecture. I just need to store some information. So if you want to see this, um, we can go and check. Uh, I have an example of this. And let me just, before going to the app, you can check in your phone. Is to at least that glitch that me, okay? Um, in fact, you can check my glitch, the code is there. So you can actually uh, see how does it work in DexDB. So let's go to Okay, it looks awful. Okay, so this is the app, and this is not only a demo about IndexedDB, this is also a demo of my designer skills. <laughs> so um, this is very simple. Basically, to at least, I don't know, I put like pasta or something like that, and something that you have to know is there are studies that shows that if you say when specifically you're going to do something, you have more chances to do it. So I want to eat pasta and make it happen. <laughs> so um, and I can put like, I don't know, 3.30 and then I can add. And the good thing about this is that this is a story in my index TV. And um, I also added to enable, enable a notification at that time of, um, and, and that date that I'm gonna have it, okay? So this is very simple. You can test it. Of course, if I refresh here, the expectation is that this item persists, okay? And uh, again, this is a very simple, but I think it's very doable for having a to-do list. Okay, let's go back. And now this is like the part where we always get confused <laughs> and service workers. Service workers is like the third part of a PWA. This is like very specific for PWAs. Anybody struggle with service worker? Like one, the other ones knows how to work with a service worker or kind of? Because if there is anybody that knows about service worker, you can be here with me, just <laughs> Okay, so um, in fact, service workers are a little bit less complicated than we think it is. And what, and what I mean with this is like at least how they work. They can start very, very simple, but then it can be very, very, very complex. And that's the part where it can get really tricky and we don't know how to, you know, like how 
to apply some kind some stuff. So my suggestion is, if you never work with a service worker or you're curious about that, start very, very small. But let's see how it works, actually. If you never, never did a service worker from scratch, I suggest to do it. Because sometimes uh, we are like, OK, PWAs, I can go to Workbox. Or another tool that I recommend is PWA Builder. It, this is like you basically put your URL in, in example with a PWA, PWA Builder. You put your URL, and it's going to give you all the tricks to put it as a, as a PWA. But sometimes we just choose things and we complete things, and we don't know how they work. So I really suggest to try to make a service worker from scratch. So let's see an example of how it starts. Again, when it's about catching, we can catch like any file, um, CSS, images, or even having an offline page. The first part is going to install a service worker. And I always show this piece of code because it's a little bit more simple than we think it is. Even though I'm not, even, I'm not sure everybody in the back can see it because I'm like, oh. but anyway, at least you have an idea about how service workers um, start. And then the first part is install a service worker. So uh, what it's going to do is going to check if a service worker doesn't exist. And then it's going to install and save those items in the list um, and save it in, in the country. Another thing that is really important is like, but everybody should do service worker or everybody should save everything. It doesn't have to be complicate, that much complicated. You can start very, very small again, and at least if your website um, doesn't show the dinosaur and says you are offline, you are doing something, OK? And that is possible with a service worker. So with this, the magic happens in fetch, right? In fetch, this is like the third uh, step. I skip the number two, which is register, when it actually it, it registered the service worker. But again, today I'm not going to focus like in every detail of the code. I want you to know how it works and which kind of stuff you can do. And in fetch is like where all the magic happens. Because at the end of the day, a service worker is a proxy that allows you to um, intercept requests and you can do whatever you want with those requests. OK? So in this case, again, very basic. The first thing that you can do is, hey, try to check um, any uh, request that has an HTML, HTML. And then if there's no response, what is going to show here? The offline page. And that offline page, it can be a very simple HTML, you're actually offline. I don't know about you, but I really hate when I'm doing something and I think that I'm still online and I'm not, right? This is a good way to improve user experience. Just to start with that. And you can completely um, can do it with any other third parts, OK? And then what else do you have? Uh, you, you can have different service worker strategies. But before that, something that is really, really useful is that you can manage specific requests, not only a, a generic um, HTTP request or response. Uh, in this case, let's say that in my web app, it's really important to always show an image. And no, you, you know when you, you don't have good connection and you have, I don't know, like a, a, a really bad connection and you have a special image that you want to show, of course you can rely on text, but sometimes it shows that broken image that looks awful, okay? What you can do is save at least one asset, 
like a, an image in, in the cache, and then if you uh, don't find that image, replace with a generic one. That's what I did here. And the magic happens in the first line because I'm saying in the first line, when you, when you don't find in the network an image, use this one that you find in the cache, okay? And that's it. That's also another thing that you can do with service workers. And then you have strategies. Because if you're familiar with uh, PWA Builder or Workbox, you, you can choose between different types of service workers. But just keep in mind a few of them, okay? Ones that you build your first service worker. Please do that before just go into deeper information. Um, of course, you can do the cache first, which if it funds in the cache, it's okay, but if, if it's not, you're just gonna fall back to network. And also you can have the opposite, network first. If it's, gonna, if it's not gonna find it on network, you're gonna have in the in the cache. And otherwise, is network only or catch only. And if we combine a good catching strategy, the ones that I mentioned at the very beginning, and then we combine that with a service worker, for me, it's like going to a restaurant here. You can have reliability because you know that you're gonna find good food, right? So there, if you apply these techniques in your web app, you already know that your user is gonna be covered. It doesn't matter how the network is um, working or not, okay? Okay, so let's summarize what we learned today. Um, first of all, trying to manage our assets in the PWA. What is a PWA and what you should require technically to build a PWA? Um, we already also learned some catching options in the client side because they exist and they can be very, very useful like IndexedDB. Uh, and also how we can combine those strategies with a service worker. Some of the resources that I have to um, share, um, I, uh, yeah, I work at Samsung Internet. I, I didn't say anything about what I do, so you're probably wondering. What, what is this person? Okay, so you, we have some of these call labs and blogs in our medium. You can find it on Samsung Internet. A book that I really, really, really like, and basically uh, I learn a lot from, from that, is Going Offline by Jeremy Keith. Of course, MDN, uh, you have a lot of these examples and updated information. We, I'm happy to say that I'm one of the MDN contrib contributors. And uh, of course, WebDev, uh, they have a whole new training of uh, PWAs. I really suggest to make that. And again, if you're wondering who is this person, uh, my accent, of course, I'm not from Italy, I'm not English, I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I've been a digital nomad, I'm a woman to make this ambassador, and currently I'm a developer advocate, um, Samsung Internet, what is Samsung Internet? I have to say this because, you know, this is my job and they pay me for that. <laughs> so uh, it's a browser. Yeah, we have a browser. So, um, and it's open source. It's, based, no, it's not open source, but it's based in Chromium, uh, which is open source. Uh, so we are also contributors of that. And it's open to every um, Android device. So yeah, grazie mille. You can find me in this um, social media. And uh, yeah, I hope that you can make me some questions. Thank you so much. If we have a question, otherwise I will. Make. Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, I want to ask, uh, how do we consider what content should be offline ready? Yeah, that is a very good question because it, it's also related with um, strategies. So check, because this is not the same for every web app, check what kind of offline experience do you want to serve to your users. For example, a newspaper maybe doesn't want any 
or most of the news as an offline because otherwise it's a lot. But there is a British newspaper, I don't remember which one, that what they do is at least they put a message, you're offline, and then the latest news, or even like a crossword. So people that are is offline can still use it, okay? So check which are the most important experience and the resources that you want to have available online. And um, thank you. And why, uh, how do you um, know what is the best strategy of, for service work instead of cash or whatever? Right, so again, it doesn't mean that you need to choose one. You can have more than one catching strategy depending on the resource. It's not like you should be uh, catch first or network first. You can have different types of strategies depending on which type of resource you want and depending on the network. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hope to see you around. So if you have any questions, uh, please come by. Thank you, Laura. Mm-hmm. <laughs>